Uh, thank you, George. That was much too kind and much more than I deserve, really. Uh, now that I know I'm going to be seen in 27 countries, I thought I'd better behave. You know. But I'm going to start off by saying that you're going to get a really pretty grim talk today. And the reason that it's going to be a pretty grim talk is the fact that I've spent most of today on the phone with my son trying to deal with a broken boiler in Bethnal Green. Because one of the things that we have to do nowadays with our kids is not only just bring them up, pay for their education, etc. So I'm moaning at all of you who are that age. But we then have to buy them houses in their apartments in London because that's the only way they can get on the property market. And unfortunately, Edward, having just moved in with a friend into his new nice apartment, and it is a nice apartment, and the boiler's blown. And at the same time as the boiler blowing, his phone also went. So you can imagine the kind of difficulties that have been involved. So nothing could be further from my mind today than the number nine counters. However, I'll do my best. And for the general mediocrity of the talk, I sort of apologise from the start. Uh, I think what George said about the initiative is essentially correct. That Dante probably did want us to think about the interrelationship, at least in certain instances, between cantos having the same number. But I'll be honest with you, it's a very long time that since I prepared a public lecture or even a piece of research which has created as many difficulties for me as today's talk. And this isn't just a kind of captatio benevolentia, you know, saying, oh, poor Zig, you know. Not only has he had to deal with sort of problems with boilers and panicked 24-year-old sons called Ed, etc., but he's also, you know, they've given him a terrible task to do here. And what I mean by that is that the difficulty is, is, is that this is not the way in which we, as Dante scholars, really think about the structure of the poem and of the way in which the poem functions, and of the ways in which we should be interpreting the poem. And it seems to me that this is something, it's been very helpful to me, to kind of think about the structure of the poem by considering the interrelationship of these cantos. And one of the questions that, of course, whenever a new approach such as the one that is being championed by Heather and George, you know, it, what it involves is really asking a question, especially for someone who's a philologist and a historicist such as myself, is what extent did Dante want us to read the Commedia vertically to use their designation? And what might the implications of this be? Now, one of the things that is clear, and it's not really just a, simply a case of semantics, I hope, is that what is clear is that Dante throughout the Commedia, encourages reflection. It's what the great American Dante scholar, Charles Singleton, termed vistas in retrospect, that at various moments in the text, that we are encouraged to look back on what we have already read, and therefore what the pilgrim has already experienced. Indeed, this is not just something, a trigger that is introduced into the text at the formal level, but it's a trigger that actually is part of the narrative itself. It's part of the diegesis. So, for instance, we'll get Petrarch, sorry, Virgil and Dante, you know, encountering a particular figure. If you think of Purgatory One, the encounter with Cato, we get a kind of mini lesson of, or a mini summary of what has happened before. Indeed, in Purgatorio 27, when the pilgrim is reluctant to walk through the wall of fire which, through which he has to pass in order to enter Eden, what, Virgil says, what we get is a, 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 an appeal to remember. Ricolditi, ricolditi. Now, therefore, what there is clearly built into the Commedia, not so much perhaps a vertical way of reading, and this is in no way a critique of what you're trying to do, because, in a sense, we're really talking about the, the same thing, is that really the appeal is to look backwards. You know, vertical sometimes gives us the idea of, of sort of from down here to going up. In fact, what Dante actually builds into the text is that we should be looking back, which in the end, it's the same exercise, but what I'm trying to do is to show how within the text itself, the particular paradigm that is being employed 
for this particular lectura dantis is a fundamental part of the construction of the text itself. Now, there's no doubt, as I've already acknowledged, and as George pointed out earlier, there are interconnections between different cantos, but not necessarily, of course, and we shouldn't forget this, cantos that are marked by the same number. Now, as far as the nines are concerned, there are obvious and clear and deliberate and explicit and really self-evident similarities between Inferno 9 and Purgatory 9. Essentially, both of them describe an entry through a locked gate. And that a passage, therefore, into a new and distinct area of the afterlife. Fundamentally, the similarities, the narrative similarities, are, in, are sort of introduced for contrast events. The what is clearly being established that we are reminded, A, on the one hand, how much the pilgrim has achieved from that time when he found himself afraid outside the city, the walls of the city of this, and indeed wanted to, in, in the previous canto, in canto 8, actually jettison the journey. He says to Virgil, and you know, and I always like to paraphrase, they say, Virgil, make me know, look, if they really don't want us to go forward, let's go back, come on, let's go back, you know. And if you think about it, that's terrible, because he's actually going against the will of God at that point. He's actually say, he's behaving in exactly the same way, the pilgrim, as those demons and other infernal inhabitants who slam the door in the face of our two travellers. And of course, there's all sorts of other contrastive elements that we can establish at that point. So the way in which the fear that he has on waking up in, pur in Purgatory 9 is immediately dispelled, and, and he's quickly reassured in a way that doesn't really happen. In Inferno 9, if you think about the, the feminine function of Lucy in contrast to that, the sort of the, 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 the representation of the Furies and the reference to Medusa, the fact, again, the myth of Medusa is in a certain sense mirrored in the shining light that emanates from the angel guardian, which, you know, which the pilgrim finds difficult to look at, but instead of turning him to smalt or, or traditionally to stone, as the myth would have it, this is actually part of that process of divine illumination that is occurring to him, etc., etc. So we have very clearly an overt connection between the two cantos. The overt connections between Inferno 9 and Purgatory 9 and the final canto bearing the number 9, Paradis, are, are at first sight at least much less apparent. It's not a canto of entry, nor is it a canto of transition, which are certainly both definitions that characterize the, ca the cantos bearing the number 9 in the preceding, two uh, the preceding two canticles. It does, however, bring, as we all know, a distinct section of the, of the Paradiso to an end. This is the last of the three heavens that find themselves within the shadow of the earth, and specifically it's the canto that brings to an end the heaven of Venus. And once we move into canto 10, with the heaven of the sun, Dante marks that opening, of that canto very clearly as a new beginning, etc. Now, there is, if, if one thinks about it, not least in light of what I've been saying so far, there is a danger as to this approach as there is to absolutely every approach. There are limitations to any way of reading. And one of them is that it kind of encourages us or sort of stimulates us to focus upon that which is obvious i.e. the fact that we both have an entrance and a barred gate, etc., etc., which I mentioned a moment before. And one of the few things that I, I, can, I can say with absolute certainty is, is that there is one poet who is never obvious, it's our friend Dante. And so that therefore there is a kind of tension immediately there. Indeed, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that in fact, if we go just a few steps outside that obvious sort of set of connections that I've been talking about. The canto that is the odd one out, out of the three, if I may put it that way, is actually Purgatory 9. And that the two canti that are most closely <coughs> interconnected, at least according to my reading this evening, are Inferno 9 and Paradiso 9. And the reason I say this is, is because the evidence is there at the formal level. 
One of the things that is striking about, if can, you can check all these things out for yourselves, never trust anything anyone standing on a podium ever tells you, go back and check things out for yourself. And what you will find is that several of the rhymes of Inferno 9 are repeated in Paradiso 9. And we don't get this in Purgatory 9. Equally, we get several of the same rhyme words in those two cantos. Now, those of you who have some knowledge of vernacular romance verse, and in particular Italian vernacular poetry, know that one of the, probably the most standard way in which interconnections between different texts was established within the Romance tradition, and, mo and more than anywhere else in Italy, from the Sicilians onwards, was through the use of common rhymes and common rhyme words. So Dante is using a standard device that had been developed within the tradition for well over a hundred years to actually bring together, almost one say, leap over, that Inferno 9 leaps over Purgatory 9 and Paradiso 9 leaps over Inferno 9 in order to establish a connection. There's also other elements that only these two cantos share. An interest in heresy. References to cemeteries investigations of the nature of evil cities, and manipulation of what was a hugely popular trope in medieval culture, that of the siege. What is it? Uh, recently, I did quite a long piece of work on Inferno 9 in particular, and Inferno 8 and that whole episode, but also more generally, in showing how important the tradition of siege writing is for the representation of the events outside the city of this. If you think about it, what we've got is, and it's an absurd siege, there's these two guys who are completely unarmed, who are prevented from entering a city by an army of più di mille, which essentially means a huge, countless, huge number of incredibly nasty, infernal inhabitants. And the whole of that episode is actually, it's not difficult, those of you who may be interested in reading the piece, there's a huge amount of sort of intertextual evidence drawn from classical, vernacular, and scriptural tradition to point at what Dante is presenting outside the walls of the city of this is a parody, a kind of parody of a siege. And there are all sorts of implications as to why that might be, which I won't go into now because it's, slightly, it's a redundant topic to the one I'm dealing with today. But if you go back and look at Paradiso 9, you will find reference to several sieges within that particular canto. So there we, we can see sort of a number of interesting and defining interconnections. At the same time, and I'm sorry if I'm belaboring the sort of the methodological, it's because it's, you know, it's made me reflect so much, you know, uh, about the issue of how it is that we read, and I have been reading since the age of 14, 15, this poem, is that one of the things that we must ensure that we do when, at the same time as doing our vertical reading, is that we continue to respect what, what might be termed as the distinctiveness of each canto. Furthermore, we need to go beyond, I feel, if we're really going to effectively use the approach that Heather and George are encouraging us to employ, rightly in the end, in my view, is that we need to go beyond what we might call simply the structural, the thematic and the ideological, and to actually look much more at the formal, at the stylistic, and in particular the way in which this particular way of reading helps illuminate what it is that Dante is doing in the Commedia, especially at the level of his poetry, what I'm going to very loosely call the exegetical. Now, there's a further temptation, a further danger inherent in his approach, and it's what I would like to term the temptation of numerology. And we know that numerology was certainly practiced in a quite a sophisticated way in medieval culture. We know Dante himself is fascinated, at least up to a point, by numbers, not least because the way in which he talks about Beatrice is in numerological terms. He constructs a poem, probably, it's probably the most sophisticated poem to date, i.e. in the early 14th century, which is based upon you know, the, the interplays of threes and tens, etc., etc. 
And, of course, when we're dealing with nines, and those of us who remember the chapter where Beatrice as the nine is discussed in the Vita Nova, is it highly tempting to use a kind of numerological approach to bind together our three cantos? Because what was... Why is Beatrice a nine? Because she's the product of the three, namely the trinity, the three times three. And that therefore the, the nine is within medieval culture associated with the miraculous, with divine intervention, with God's power. All elements which of course find a place whether it's the entry of the celestial messenger, whether it's the entry of Lucy, whether it's the prophecies in Paradiso 9 of divine intervention in the foreseeable future. Now, if we think about it, in the end, actually the numerological is not the right approach because those points, miracle, divine intervention, God's power, are constants within the Commedia. We can find them, I would argue, in just about every canto. Because they're one of the, if you want, the load-bearing fundamental structures that carry the weight, the ideological weight and the narrative weight of the copy. So, in a sense, again, the danger of the obvious rears its ugly head. Now, therefore, the responsibility that one has as the person upon the podium is to see to what extent we can establish elements that seem to be distinctive to the interrelationship between the three cantos. And essentially, the way I thought about them is elements that one might tag as explicit and elements which one might tag as implicit. Though I'm the first to admit that the distinction is somewhat artificial because it's going to be subjective and that therefore it's to be used with a, a certain likeness of touch. And I hope that the examples I give you will clarify it better than I can in definitional terms, what it is that I mean by explicit and implicit. Now, the most evident, of course, of the explicit elements uniting the three canti are structural ones, as we've seen. And this is, in fact, confirmed from within Paradiso 9 itself, as the two quotations, 1a and 1b, make clear, where the poet encourages us to consider the interrelationship between heaven, earth, and hell, and the interrelationship in the second quotation between heaven and purgatory, etc. Now, on the one hand, of course, when Dante wants us to reflect upon the complexity of the universe, the distinct part of the universe, he's doing this on the one hand, as we've already seen, for contrast events, but also, and probably more normally, in order to highlight the harmony of divine organization, of God as a harmonious, ordered maker. Though it's an example of the working, of the miraculous working of divine providence. But at the same time, both here and elsewhere, as we shall see, it is also a way in which Dante wants us to think about the organization of the Commedia itself, which, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Dante models upon God's two books, namely upon the Bible and upon creation, both of which by their very nature, since they are creations of God the maker, God the artist, the Deus Artifacts, as they would have said in the Middle Ages, are by their very nature harmonious, perfect, ordered, etc. So that the Commedia itself, in its numerological structure, in its interplay of threes and tens, both of them sacred number to constitute a one which is another sacred number, are meant to reflect the harmony of the divine. The fact, as Dante says, will say later on in Paradiso, and indeed makes clear from the very opening canto, this is a poem to a poem, mano e cielo e terra, that this is a poem where both heaven and earth have come together in its creation. Heaven is, of course, God. Earth is, of course, his own artistic ability. So Dante presents himself as a scribade, equivalent to a writer of scripture, with all the implications that that brings for the status of the Commedia as a divine text. Now, at the same time, this emphasis upon the harmony, the organization of the text, etc., is also a way of pointing to Dante's control 
over the tax, that he's the guy in charge in constructing the tax. To go back to that quotation of, of heaven and earth, what it is that God brings to the table or to the creation of this tax is that he supplies the content broadly understood. But what it is that the earth brings, the earthly poet, is actually the artistic organization of the text, the words on the page. Now, this is not something that Dante invents, but it was a standard viewpoint that really since the latter part of the 12th century onwards had been used in order to define the way in which earthly authors, whether they're Moses or one of the authors of one of the, 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 the Gospels, etc., what is it that God brings to a scriptural book? What is it that the human author brings to a scriptural book? So Dante is working within that particular paradigm. So this is why Dante later on in Paradise can say, you know, that he is a better poet than David. There's nothing blasphemous or unorthodox in this. He's simply comparing his literary abilities to those of David, the author of the Psalms, etc., and here, for instance, we get a nice example of the way in which Dante points to his control of the text. If we look at the first of those quotations, 1A, and we are told that, uh, but down below, the, shades grow, the shade grows darker when the mind feels sorrow. This notion of abuyare, the growing darker, i.e., that therefore what it's saying is that the souls in hell, as they suffer, so their appearance grows darker. Now we've never known this before. He's never told us this in Inferno. He'd never told us this in Purgatorio. The first time that we learn this detail of the reality of the infernal afterlife is at this point. It is because the author has decided to tell us here rather than somewhere else. It's a clear sign of the control that he's exercising over his text, of the selection that he is making you know, in the way in which he makes his contribution in the telling of this divinely willed experience that is his story, that is that are, you know, the story that he tells us of his journey through the afterlife. And so, so within this perspective of a text that is highly organized, what it also, it therefore provides, if you want, supporting evidence precisely for the type of reading that I'm attempting to do today, namely of a reading of a text which is huge, which, whose elements are incredibly, are interconnected in an incredibly sophisticated and complex manner. Now, I was just checking the time, and as always these things happen, I have too much material, and I was going to talk a little bit, but I'm not going to bother now, I'm going to want to move on to something else. It's really, I was going to talk for several minutes on what I meant by the exegetical and showing the interrelationship between that block of quotations 2A, 2B, 2C, or which are all of them appeals to the reader. And just it's very interesting how, you know, just to give you a sense of what's going on is that on the one hand we're, we talk, Dante talks of healthy intellect, but then later on he talks of anime ganate, souls that are deceived, creatures without reverence, who twist your hearts away from such good. So he's already setting up, we can sort of establish quite a complex discourse going on here between, on the one hand, if you want, proper application of our human reason, and on the other hand, improper application of our human reason. And again, I see this as kind of a deliberate sort of a intent, not least when we look again, if we look at the relationship between 2A and 2B, in both of those, Dante is telling us something about how to read his own poem. And one can establish all sorts of interconnections. Again, if we bring to our examples of two, and you can do this for yourselves to try to see exactly what it is I might be thinking about, is look at the two quotations from 3A and 3B, where, for instance, 3A talks about the need to interpret the gospel, to interpret the docs, to interpret the church fathers, rather than sort of canon law, which is what the Decretali is referring to. 
So Dante, we've got a kind of complex interrelationship here again between how to read the, the Commedia on the one hand, that quota, uh, quotation 2a, how one should read what it is that proper reading involves, namely proper interpretation involves, namely the interpretation of the Bible, the church fathers, etc., what is it, how that involves a proper application of reason, how greed can lead away from proper interpretation, from a proper reading of literature, etc., etc. So there's a lot that one can actually develop on the basis of those quotations that I've numbered two and three. And very clearly the fact that we have a, appeals to the reader in each of these cantos, and appeals to the readers are not that common in the poem, although they tend to be extremely memorable, and usually the impression that readers have is that there's rather more of them than there actually are. And the fact that there should be one in each of these cantos is clearly another element which would suggest that a vertical reading is not inappropriate, but then we need to sort of work out precisely what it is, how it is that we are to interpret the interrelationship between these three, these three, uh, these three appeals to the reader. What I want to talk about, and to fit in with the title of my talk, which, uh, as some of you will have seen, is it termed Without Violence, which is a quotation from Inferno 9, and I'll come back to that. And I really want to look at what I see as to be the major implicit concern uniting the three cantos. So the most striking cluster connected uh, of elements that connect the three cantos are elements linked to violence. Violence broadly understood. Although I will be focusing down on particular aspects of violence in the latter part of my talk. And essentially what I mean by violence, it's always useful to define one's terms, and I'm going to define it again rather widely, is the act of inflicting physical or emotional suffering upon others. Now, of course, violence and that general definition that I've just given inevitably brings together, sort of evokes a whole series of other concepts and problems, namely the problem of pain, the problem of cruelty, the problem of torture, which had become increasingly an issue within medieval culture, especially legal culture, etc. Now, what's striking is that, as a dantist, is that the problem of violence in the Commedia, and more generally in Dante, is a topic that has been very little studied. Despite that ocean of critical writing on Dante, which probably began during Dante's own lifetime, and which has continued and abated and growing exponentially up to this moment, is that there are no major studies of violence in Dante. Often the most obvious things get sort of missed. It's very interesting. It's not the first time in my career as a dentist that I've stumbled across you know, something that's blindingly obvious, and then and somehow the tradition has... You know, you often don't see that stone over which you trip that's directly in front of you. Yet, if we think about it, those of you perhaps who've done some medieval history or are indeed medieval historians will know that one of the predominant ways in which medievalists have been talking about the Middle Ages, now for a number of decades, is in terms of violence. That the Middle Ages is to be defined, can one of the most obvious ways, at least, so some of my colleagues will claim, in which one can define the Middle Ages is in terms of violence and its relationship to violence. That the Middle Ages was a violent world. If you think about all those Game of Thrones, which... <laughs> they, they all, everything's relevant in the end. It's the, the kind of attitude that we have to the Middle Ages is not poorly reflected in something like Game of Thrones or all those other films set in the Middle Ages, which invariably center upon violence, and a kind of violence involving whole societies, the massacre of peasants, etc., people being burnt at the stakes, maidens being ravished, etc., etc. So it makes it even more peculiar that we shouldn't have considered this in terms of Dante. At the same time, also if we think about some of Dante's principal sources, all those Latin epics from the Aeneid to the Lucan's Pharsalia, from Statius Sibiades to 
of its metamorphoses. They're, they're a bloody mess, aren't they? <laughs> Not only that, the Bible. When was the last time any of you sort of read the Old Testament before going to sleep and read the massacre of Jericho and then sort of had nightmares and we will be coming back to the, the siege of Jericho later on? The Old Testament is an extremely violent piece of writing, and consistently so. So his principal sources are sources that are predicated upon the representation of violence. Furthermore, as many cultural historians of the Middle Ages have pointed out, since the 12th century, there's an increasing emphasis on violence within all areas of medieval culture. Just think of representations, in particular visual, but not only of Christ's passion, where we get some really rather terrifying... I don't know if any of you have seen Saw movies or those hostile movies, which are thoroughly unpleasant. You know, the kind of equivalent, really, of the sort of splatter movies that are sort of made for general consumption nowadays, and that, at least the iconography of Christ's passion was also for general consumption. Martyr narratives. And indeed, martyr narratives have got something to do with our three counters, because one of the most famous martyr narratives of the Middle Ages is, of course, Lucy's martyrdom, the horrible and foul things that were done to poor Lucy, that, precisely that same Lucy, who comes to bear the pilgrim to the gates of, of purgatory. What's even more interesting, that the, probably the most influential at least for Dante's time, account of Lucy's martyrdom and suffering, etc., is that contained in Jacobo da Voragine's Legenda Aurea. And as far as you know, I reread it, perhaps somebody, we should have reread it long before, what we discover is that Dante actually takes many elements from that particular narrative of Lucy's martyrdom and transforms them into something quite different in Purgatorio Nine. Just to give you one example, flames that actually that, that cause great pain, but don't actually burn. That's a motif that we find in Purgatory Nine, it's what wakes him up, but it's a motif that comes from the martyrdom of Lucy. And there are many other elements of this sort. So there's a kind of transformation, if you want a sublimation, and actually a moving away by Dante from the original narrative into a new context, where in fact the horrific elements, the splatter elements that characterize that narrative are now being used for salvific purposes, for a, telling a different type of story, but they lie behind. There's a kind of, if you want, tension going on. Furthermore, as I'm sure some of you are aware, and again, if I have time, I'll be talking about this, is that an in, although within Christian culture, and already in the Old Testament, there is a consistent recourse to what one might call the language of arms. And just think of church triumph and Christ's triumph, which is actually a metaphor that is employed at the latter part of Canto 9 of Paradiso the various swords, etc., that we have angels carrying. These are all motifs that come from the New and the Old Testament. That from the 12th century onwards, connected to the debates around the Crusades, the militarization of Christianity is really something that is rather striking. I'm not an expert in the field, but over the last year or so, I've actually read quite a lot of studies on this particular problem. And there seems to be consensus amongst it, and that this is a characterizing feature precisely of the discourses around Christianity around Dante's time. If we think about, try to think sort of of the three cantos together, there's a remarkable breadth of examples of violence in our three cantos. Here's just a few instances. In Inferno 9, in line 7, we're talked about a pugna, a battle, a fight. There's the siege that I've already mentioned. Erixo. Now, if there's a nasty piece of work in these three, it's Erixo. The Furies, Medusa, Theseus, Hercules, and so on. Purgatorio 9. We've got acts of abduction. 
Aurora and Ganymede of rape. Again, Ganymede and the story of Procne and Philomela and that appalling person who was Procne's husband or whichever, Tereus, which is a story that also involves, involves infanticide, cannibalism. The death of Achilles, Julius Caesar, now there's another nasty piece of work. In fact, we've got sex and violence going on in Purgatory 9, if you think about it, in terms of the example. Furthermore, there are clear references to the first sonnet of the Vita Nova, the one where we've got the god of love sort of taking, in a, not in a particularly pleasant way, Beatrice, who is scantily clad, and forcing her to eat his heart. There's clear echoes of that particular sonnet in Purgatory 9. Paradiso 9 is, in many ways, the most violent of all the cantos. So while we're up in heaven, we've got reference to Ed Solino, that appalling tyrant from the north of Italy, as well as various other acts of contemporary violence. We've got a couple of suicides just thrown in, bloody sieges, the slaughter of Mar <coughs> at Marseille, of Jericho, of the Albigensians of Laval, and the whole issue of the Albigensian Crusades, which, you know, they were... They were not nice, those Albigensian Christians. That's the only way I can put it, you know. They were dreadful events. There's a whole tradition, precisely, of attacking what had been done there in the south of France. And the Crusades themselves, the crucifixion, so on. So, of course, let's conclude Dante is the poet of violence. And you will find many people who will throw that out as starkly as that. There is no text more bloody, more violent, than Dante's Commedia. It is a text which absolutely encapsulates that Middle Ages, which is so violent it becomes a kind of synecdoche of the general violence that is the Middle Ages. And those of you who know me know exactly what next rhetorical trick I'm going to use, which is, <laughs> that's a load of bollocks, you know, to put it bluntly. Because, let's start thinking about it, let's actually start looking at the text. Let's start asking ourselves, what is Dante's attitude to violence? Namely, what is his ideology of violence? What is, how does he think about violence? How does he represent violence? How does he describe acts of violence? How does he use terminology relating to violence? How also does he treat figures and events <laughs> which are marked and represented as violent in the tradition. That's where we're going to actually get some hard evidence as to, what he, as to how Dante works. Let me give you one example. Let's look at example number four, which, in its convoluted way, is a description of the crucifixion. Now, where... If you look at any description of contemporary description of the crucifixion or any visual representation of the crucifixion, there's blood everywhere. There would be countries where those images would not be getting sort of, you know, whatever it is that the PGR, you know, sort of, I've forgotten the word now. This is one of the problems when you sort of talk like this. Occasionally language abandons you, and as you get older, this happens more and more frequently, you know. <laughs> There's no blood, it's bloodless. This is, within a medieval context, this is so shocking, in inverted commas, this is so unusual. In fact, go and look at Dante's other references to the crucifixion, and what you will find is how understated they are. Not only that, let me, this is not something that I discovered myself, but one of my, those students of mine that George kindly mentioned, who, Paola Nasti, who is, a, I view, an extremely good Dante scholar, extremely original, who teaches at the University of Reading, she's been doing some work on the Franciscan tradition and on the way in which the Franciscan tradition talks about, represents Francis, and in particular that key moment of the Franciscan story, namely the stigmata. Dante's account of the stigmata is the only account in the whole of the extant tradition 
where there is no mention of blood. One can only think and conclude that that must have been deliberate, in the same way that Dante here deliberately underplays the horrors, the graphic horrors of the passion. His account of the crucifixion is bloodless, it's highly elusive. And indeed what becomes even more interesting is if we actually read, reading the three cantos, what are the most detailed descriptions of violence that we find in the three cantos? Descriptions of violence. They are not descriptions of human violence. They're actually descriptions of violence related to nature. It's the wind in Canto 9. It's the image of the frog and the snake in Canto 9. It's the rapacious eagle of Purgatorio 9. Or it's the roaring lion to whom, to which the sound of the door of purgatory opening in Purgatorio 9 is compared. <coughs> and indeed, many of those similes are not even direct, so, so those descriptions are not direct descriptions of events actually happening in the afterlife, but they are similes. The wind simile, if you remember, is in order to describe the coming of the celestial messenger. Furthermore, what's interesting here is that as if we go back to that gate of purgatory, the image of the lion, of the roar of the lion, that comes, that particular episode comes from Luke and Farsadi. In fact, across these three cantos, the only explicit textual reference, there are lots of implicit classical allusions all over the place, but where we can actually pinpoint a particular <coughs> borrowing in a particular text, all three of them, one per canticle, come from Luke and Pharsalia, the most violent of all the classical epics. And that is clearly, you know, for, at least for the sophisticated reader, at least in my mind, and I'm not a sophisticated reader, it suggests that, you know, some sort of contrast between the representations of violence in Luke and and the way in which he is representing violence in his own particular poem. Furthermore, if you look at all those examples, 5a, 5b, 5c, 5d, all of those deal with blood. Only one of them is a direct description of a bloody scene. And this is simply, he says, to Furin Fernaldi Sanguetinte. If you go and look within the tradition at descriptions of furies, this is so understated, it's almost, you know, you might as well, it's so boring, you might as well go off to sleep at this point. The others, they're either similes in order to describe this colour, which is the second example of the step, so it's not even a description of a bloody action, and the other two are peripheries, really rather convoluted ways to talk about massacres. And because of the complex rhetorical construction of the peripheries in 5C and 5D, there's a kind of dissipation of the direct representation of violence. There's none of, go, you know, when you go home, open the Pharsalia at random, look at books 10 to 12 of the Aeneid, open <coughs> Spacious Sabiades at random, etc., open the altar, and look at the way in which descriptions of massacres are undertaken in those texts. That is at one end, these other texts, the tradition, deals with these matters in precisely the opposite. He uses what the Middle Ages would have termed reticentia, which all of you will have grasped is reticence, of doing things you know, in a sort of understated way, which alas I can't do. <laughs> so he uses circumlocution, he uses deflection, he uses brevity. Dante is the great poet of brevity, which is actually the opposite of the way in which the epic tradition normally works. And it's complemented, and you can find these for yourselves. The use of epithets, single terms, metaphors. There is no lingering upon violence. Dante is not the poet of violence. If one considers his representational techniques in these three cantos, 
and compares them to, to, to the tradition, Dante clearly comes out as the poet who is against violence. For when I am weak, then I am powerful. As Paul says in the letters of the Corinthians, which is actually rather unusual since Paul is one of the major militarizers of Christian language elsewhere. It seems to me that if we think about it, we have a most unusual epic hero in this poem. He goes around meeting all these dangers without a weapon. Just the two of them. It's the opposite of those heavily armed knights of the tradition. God's violence, i.e. the violent God of the Old Testament, is underplayed throughout the Commedia. The point is, is that these three cantos are not atypical. They are in fact typical of the way in which Dante throughout the Commedia represents acts of violence. Look at the mess song. All he needs is a little wand. And that's enough to open the gates. Look at Christ's triumph, the way in which Dante, we've just, is that quotation number four. And the angel, the sword that the angel bears in Purgatorio Mind is not a sword that will do horrible things, chop bits off you, but it's a sword that saves. Dante is, as people have begun to recognize, this is one area where some work has been done, including by Claire Honus here in the United Kingdom is the great poet of peace. If you want, his Christianity is quintessentially a New Testament Christianity. I think one of the things that Dante is being critical of is the representation of violence in literature. And violence is something that crosses genres. It's a way of engaging with literature as a whole, not just with one specific part of the tradition. And what he seems to be concerned, and he's not the only one we find in some sort of uh, religious writers a similar concern being expressed, is that there are dangers in representing violence, especially if we glorify it, which is what the epic tradition does. What does it do with a figure such as Aeneas? It glorifies the fact that Aeneas can go around lopping people's heads off that he is successful through violence, because in part, there was a belief that words can lead to actions. And this is something that unites sort of reflection from issues of obscenity, etc., talking about sex, that this will lead to actual sexual activity. And the same way that sort of talking about violence will lead you to be violent. And there are in fact some of the thinkers actually thought that there is no distinction as regards the gravity of the sin between talking about something and actually performing that particular sinful action. Now, what we have with Dante is a much more complex presentation. As I've already suggested, Paradiso is probably the most violent of the cantos. And that what we have, strikingly, is the way in which things are set up in these cantos is a contrast between sinful humanity that seems to be dedicated to violence, even if that violence is not directly represented. And very often, for instance, if we think of something like Dido's suicide, or the whole story of Procne and Tereus and Philomela, which is one of the most horrific stories from Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's the story of the guy who's married, rapes the sister to stop her speaking, lock, cuts her tongue out, she gets saved by her other sister, she weaves a tapestry or something, manages to communicate what's happened to her. She, the mother, then the wife then goes mad, kills the child, feeds the child to the husband who has raped the sister. Great stuff, isn't it? You know. Even a, a sophisticated and as elegant a poet as Chrétien de Troyes, who arguably, in my view, is after Dante the finest vernacular romance epic poet, writes a play on this, uh, writes a poem, a whole poem on called Philomel, which some scholars have argued precisely because of its unpleasant violence could not have been written by sweet old Chrétien. But the Philomel story is throughout the Middle Ages well known. And again, 
typically Dante, just drops off. He doesn't even talk about the story directly, he talks about it indirectly in Purgatory 9. By alluding to the swallows that sing their sang songs at dawn, <coughs> which everybody knew what they were referencing to, because the two sisters, when they're being chased by the vengeful husband who's just started digesting his son, they're turned by some sort of a kind god or goddess into swallows, and that's how they escape. It's that elusiveness. It's where, on the one hand, the tradition, if you want, gloried in the gore. Dante elusively introduces the element, but doesn't linger on it in any way. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. He downplays it. And what we have is a kind of, there's a contrast, I would argue, within these cantu between a sinful humanity on the one hand, a violent sinful humanity, and celestial triumph. A triumph that is achieved by having violence, not by executing violence on others, but by having violence inflicted. Christ, Peter, that is mentioned at the end, the other martyrs. The way in which he downplays the siege of Jericho. Go and read in Joshua the siege of Jericho. And if there is violence, Dante is not a pacifist in the modern sense. I want that to be clear. He accepts that there are times inevitably when there will have to violent action will have to be taken. And of course, as I'm sure some of you know, there's been there was a debate within Christianity from the very origins, right up to Dante's time as to whether violence was ever, you know, Christ said, turn the other cheek. But then Christ himself had his moments of violence, as with the sellers in the temple, or the blighting of that poor fig tree, which for me is one of the most enigmatic passages of the New Testament. But violence, according to Dante, and this comes, it's very clear, in a work such as the Monarchia, has to be <coughs> proportionate, and has to be as minimal as possible. This is why Dante would like to resolve everything by duels. Because that's the way in which the least violence is being inflicted upon the smallest number of people. And here, this is why the treatment of the Crusades here is so ambivalent. Some scholars don't even think there is a reference to the Crusades in here. I, I believe there is, and I may have some time to explain to you why. But it's because Dante is so elusive and oblique. Because he clearly has problems even with the Crusades. He accepts on the one hand that the Holy Sepulchre needs to be freed. But on the other hand, he clearly has anxieties about the fact that this is going to lead to killing of other people. Yes, and what there are, in my view, highly sort of elusive references to crusading and to warfare in general, <coughs> such as the oblique referencing to a siege that I've already mentioned. And that therefore this oblique referencing to warfare, to martial violence, is again, as I've already said, a way in which he's distinguishing himself from the epic tradition and really creating that new type of Christian epic that the Commedia wishes to be. And that within the concern with the martial in these three cantos, that aspect of the martial that he focuses most is crusading. Now, the first thing to say is that Virgil and the Pilgrim in Infernal Nine are crusaders. They enter into a grotesque Jerusalem, which is what this is. And a number of people have worked on the way in which this is a parody, or at least it's the evil Jerusalem, because Jerusalem within the tradition was both analyzed, treated both positively in positive terms and in negative terms. And we know that Dante presents Jerusalem, oh, sorry, the city of this. He says he could see mosques from the distance. And actually, this was a standard way which, by Dante's time, people were depicting Jerusalem as a Western city, with, but, within, but within which there are elements of Islamic architecture, etc. And so Dante has already set that up, if I'm not mistaken, in Inferno, in Inferno 8. But when we enter, what is it that they see, the pilgrims? They see tombs. And what was the whole point of the Crusades was the freeing of the tomb of Christ. By the time we get to Inferno 10, 
the connection with the tomb of Christ is made explicit, where Farinata is a, parod uh, is a parodic, grotesque representation of Jesus rising out of the tomb. Now, sorry, I've got them on the wrong page of my quotes. <laughs> Dante makes some direct references, doesn't he, to the Holy Land in Paradiso 9. It's quotations 6a and 6b. One is to the siege of Jericho, the other one is to the birthplace of Christ, which is Nazareth. He doesn't actually explicitly <coughs> refer to Jerusalem. But we can be certain that Dante is, in fact, alluding to the Crusades, even if, you know, this is part of a much more complex treatment within this canto of damned and saved cities, because there's a hell of a lot of cities that are mentioned across these cantos, and we get a representation, you know, of an actual city, don't we, with the treatment of the city of this. But the reason why we can be certain is that there are important intertexts that emerge in these cantos, and in particular in Canto 9 of Paradiso which connect with contemporary crusade literature. Both those Latin texts that preached the crusades and those vernacular poetic texts which reacted to the crusade. And if you look at that quotation from Guido Riquier, uh, an Occitan poet, lamenting the fact the, the lack of success of the Crusades. It's striking how close what Guiro says to especially some of the, the, the quotation in 6b that I provided just above. But what's even more interesting is the connection between Paradiso 9 and the texts of preaching the Crusades. Both Joshua and Rahab, as in Paradiso 9, appear with a degree of regularity in these particular texts, the texts that preach the crusade. They're an attack upon the powerful for the failure of the crusade, exactly as we get here. Also, furthermore, there's reference made to Peter. Greed is seen as one of the factors that prevents success for the crusade. The people lament the fact, as we have here with Guido, that the Holy Land is being ignored. There's reference, as with Dante, to Christ's hands and to the crucifixion more generally. There's often reference in these texts to keys, to swords, to angelic messengers, to victory through Christ, victory through the cross. There's even mention quite often that those who will die will be taken to the portas, Paradisi, to the gates of paradise. So in fact, we might argue that at least implicitly, 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 there's a kind of ghostly gate, even in Purgatorio 9, which is the ghostly gate of paradise referred to in crusade literature. Furthermore, it was a commonplace that these doors of paradise that I've just mentioned were open to martyred crusaders. If you died on the crusade, you would go straight to paradise. And crusaders are those who are signed. Cruces signati. That was the term that was used in the Middle Ages. Signed with the, signed with the cross. And that there were two scriptural authorities, two scriptural passages, 8a and 8b, Ezekiel 9, 3 to 11, Revelation 7, 2 to 3, and sometimes also verse 9 which were used to sort of support the idea of being signed by the cross. And you can read them. This is, one of them is the Thou ones, and the other one, I can't remember, read them for yourself. But what's very interesting is that they are the principal sources that Dantists have recognized, though not recognizing their connection with crusader literature, for that, sorry, for that, odd event that has caused so much debate in Dante scholarship, the marking of the seven Ps with the sword upon the forehead of the pilgrim, which is your quotation nine. So the pilgrim, too, is being signed in the way that a crusader was signed. 
at the beginning of his, pil of his journey. I said pilgrimage nearly, and I was correct, because they were considered to be pilgrims, just as our heroes are. That the crusade was actually, is one of the ways, if you want, of pushing to one side the reality of what they were doing by sort of transforming it not into a kind of an invasion, a warlike invasion, but into a peregrinatio, into a pilgrimage. But his pilgrimage, our hero's pilgrimage, is a pilgrimage that occurs without violence. He eschews violence. He doesn't go around killing the way in which the crusaders did. And this is a journey to the gates in the afterlife, including the gates of paradise, which he has undertaken whilst he is still alive. Whilst the crusader was he who had died violently and then would be taken straight up to heaven. Which I presume how, according at least to some, Tatraguida would have found himself in the heaven of Mars because he died precisely as one of these crusaders. But what's more interesting is that unlike the crusaders, our hero, our pilgrim, our crusader, undergoes a process of confession and purgation before he actually reaches paradise. And we know that Dante, again, an area which he finds problematic is the granting of indulgences. And clearly, if what I'm suggesting has a degree of merit, that here we've got a kind of, across these cantos, and in particular in nine, in Canto Nine of Paradiso, a playing out of issues related to the Crusades and to the debate around the Crusades, the fact that our particular Crusader has to undergo confession and purgation, which Crusaders, the one of the ways in which people were convinced to go on the Crusades, they were bribed, spiritually bribed by their religious leaders to go on that, was the promise that you would not have to confess and purge. If you died on the Crusades, you would go straight to heaven. It's interesting that my suggestion is that Dante is again, in this elusive way, which is so typically Dantean, critiquing that particular aspect of church power. As I've said, it's typical, the way in which he deals with the crusade of Dante's ambivalent attitude to the crusade in general, to violence in general. He's not a pacifist, as I've said in the modern sense, but he's undoubtedly against violence, and in particular, the, represent the graphic representation of violence. <coughs> kind of way, an indiscriminate exercise of violence. That it's something that one uses in a last resort, and then in a commensurate and in a moderate manner. If I of time now, something rather interesting I wanted to talk about was the impact of a school text on these three counties. Some of you may have heard of the Eclogue of Theodolus, which was a school text, which Again, strangely, this was something that Dante would have almost certainly read when he was at school. There is no work on Dante and the Eclogue of Theodorus. And yet, there's a very effective case to make that Purgatory 9 in particular is largely constructed of elements, in Teralia, of course, because with Dante there's always a stratification of different elements, but that one of the primary sources for Purgatory 9 is the Eclogue of Theodorus. But it's time to bring things to a conclusion. I think one of the things that Dante has, and we're very aware of this, just the very choice of Virgil as his guide, is that Dante does not have a stark oppositional sense, as there is in the Eclogue of Theodolus, and in much of the writing, and indeed in crusade propaganda, of a kind of us and them ideology. Pagan versus Christian, ancient versus modern, etc., etc. He sees providential history as something much more complex and actually as something that is single, i.e. there's a continuity. Of course the incarnation is fundamental. Of course there are certain things that cannot occur before the incarnation. But he thinks of humanity as a single entity. That justice which he talks about, that peace that he talks about, is a peace for everybody. Salvation is there for everyone. He thinks in terms of unity rather than opposition. To put it in modern terms, I don't know whether Dante would approve, and as a philologist, I feel uncomfortable, he thinks, he talks, he, he has an idea of a common humanity. 
And I wonder whether this notion of a common humanity is why it is at the basis of what I consider to be his anti-violence. Which, in a sense, links up with what I was saying about Rossellini on Tuesday. Kind of interesting. I hadn't noticed, actually, until I was looking at my notes today. Sans alcuna guerra. This phrase in Canto, te, uh, my, which is quotation number 10, Inferno 906, <coughs> which I checked in various translations, and everybody, it's, an, it's a hellishly difficult sansa guerra, without war, without violence, without all sorts of things people say. But essentially, the Italian is much more, Dante's Italian is much more subtle than anything that I, that my, without violence can capture. But it, I felt that it, that the title, even in English, would give a sense of what I wanted to talk about. I think that that sans alcuna guerra, which is how they enter into the city of this, without violence, without warfare, they enter the Jerusalem, these crusaders, without any act of violence, effectively encapsulates my argument. A victory without violence. And that therefore this explains to us also, if victory is to be achieved about violence, that therefore this is why the poet, I believe, carefully avoids the representation of violence. He makes much reference to lots of violent acts. I gave you a, a catalogue half an hour or so ago. Of, but he just simply alludes to them. He may just drop a name. He'll use a circumlocution. He'll use one epithet. There is no lingering upon the representation of violence. And I think that this reticence, when it comes to violence, really does reveal quite a lot about Dante's ideological sympathies and where we should locate him in contemporary discussions about the appropriateness of violence. <coughs> and indeed, an article which I only read this week on Monday, which argues that Purgatory 9 actually has very powerful Franciscan <coughs> elements embedded into it. At the most obvious level, the, the garb of the angel, and this is something we've, we've known for a long time, it probably recalls the garb of a Mendicon friar and Franciscan in particular, that if Perg 9 is a heavily Franciscan canto, which we then need to look whether Franciscan elements are also present in the other two nines, and it is amongst the Franciscans where some of the most pacifist in inverted commas positions were being argued at the time. The fact that Dante, one of these key cantors where the, these issues surrounding violence are so central, at least according to me, you may disagree and that's fine by me, that, what, that this would make my argument even more sort of substantial. Because Dante, through the way in which he draws on Franciscan elements in Purgatorio 9, would also be pointing to where, even if I hadn't read Purgatorio, the, this new study of Purgatorio 9, I would have wanted to be suggesting that Dante, that's where Dante's sympathy lies, in relation to sort of Franciscan pacifist positions of the time. But there's much work to do. I'm scratching the surface, because as I said, Dante's scholarship has shown scant, if any, interest at all on this. How successful is a mode of reading? I have to be honest with you, I think, in the end, I probably wouldn't have grasped the crusading dimension of Purgatory 9 if I hadn't done a vertical reading. And I certainly wouldn't have sort of appreciated some of the highly suggestive compositional insights that have emerged, the kind of interconnections between the cantos. But I think much of the others, just a standard lectura dantis, would have probably led me to reading Paradiso 9, not Purgatory 9, in Crusader terms. What strengthened that the fact that this position was not invalid was exactly when I brought them together with Inferno 9 and Purgatory and Pur 9. What's more interesting is something else. It's, let me just give you one example. There's been a huge debate, if you look at 11b, who exa what exactly the cold animal is, il freddo animale, set in the semblance of the cold animal that strikes people with its tail. Now, quite often, Dante scholars, reasonably, have pointed that the source is Revelation 9.5, and you can see immediately that, that Cruciatus scorpium cum percutit hominem, the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. But, you know, it's not difficult to see that as the source. 
However, the debate continues to rage. Cold animal was often the standard term used to refer to a fish, and there may be a way in which Pisces, the constellation of Pisces rather than Scorpio, is relevant in the astronomical periphrases at the beginning of Canto 9. What seems to me to make that particular intertext, i.e., that the Freddo animale, the scorpion, is certainly the, is the scorpion, is the fact that that passage of Apocalypse 9 5 the source that has been recognized for Purgatorio 9, lines 5 to 6, in Crusader literature was very, very frequently linked together and quoted together with that long passage, Ezekiel 9, 3 to 11, that I pointed out earlier to you. It would seem to be that precisely because of that combination, it makes it that much more certain that, that the freddo animale is the scorpion. And I think that ultimately what is going to be most valuable that will emerge from the vertical reading is that we're actually going to get a better understanding of what one, as the example I've just cited to you, what one might term the deeper structures, that we're actually going to be able to penetrate much more deeply and effectively into the core of Dante's writing, of seeing how different sort of elements in the culture that he is reappropriating have an effect across a number of cantos. Thank you so much for being too patient.